everybody, and welcome to St. John's, where whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Please stand as you are able to worship with us. It's so good to see you all today. It is so good to see you. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. If I tear up a little bit every now and then, for those of you watching online or who may be new, it is so terrific to be back in one piece. I am missing some pieces, but, and a few pounds, yeah. But, uh, but I'm back in one piece and I'm going to be 100% very, very soon. And I am so grateful to all of you for making sure that we never missed a service, we never missed a meal. All of our ministries continued unabated and you all stepped in to fill the gap where there were gaps. And I especially want to thank Pastor Mary and Pastor Hank. Can you give them a round of applause for doing everything they could to make sure that things got handled? And then also to Skip, I don't know if he's here today, but he came out of retirement to help, and then, which was wonderful. And then all of you, all of our amazing St. John's volunteers, you all are the heart of this church. You are the hands and feet of God in everything we do in the community. And I'm so, so grateful for all of you. And like I said, I'm going to stay rooted in gratitude. If I tear up every now and then, just forgive me if you're new, because it's been a long month, and I'm extremely grateful to be here, and I'm extremely grateful for all of you. And most importantly, I'm grateful to God. So we'll give... We'll give God some credit, right? But today, as on all Sundays, 
we invite you to come when you can. Come as you are, even if you might be missing some parts and you're a little scarred up, literally or metaphorically. Come when you can. Come as you are, but prepare to be transformed because our faith may be 2,000 years old, but our thinking is not. Our thinking is not. So we start every worship service by warmly greeting one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please greet one another with words of welcome and the peace of God. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Jesus, God sent you in mercy to be Emmanuel, God with us. Teach us compassion of God. Jesus, your life took flesh in the mercy of Mary's womb. We rejoice in the compassion of Mary. Jesus, your family took shape in the mercy of Joseph's welcome. We give thanks for the compassion of Joseph. Jesus, your holy family knew the struggle of the poor when they were refused the mercy of shelter in Bethlehem. Teach us the compassion of God. Lead us in the way of justice and mercy. Um, please be seated as we light the second Advent candle. Good morning. I Hello. I'm Rachel. I'm Levi. I'm Rob. I'm Elijah. I'm Jay. And I'm Caleb. 2 weeks ago we lit the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. Last week we lit the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace. Today, when I look around, I see sh shadows of sadness, families who have lost loved ones, people in prison, people who are isolated and feel alone. I see shadows of grief, people dreading the holidays because of painful memories or because they don't want to spend Christmas alone. In the face of sadness, grief, and loss, we light the candle of joy. May the light from this candle overwhelm the world. May the light from this candle say to all that God's joy is coming on earth as it already is in heaven. Friends, be not afraid. God is at hand.
watching light shine down Come around leaving us For the close and far away The Hebrew Bible reading is from the Book of Psalms, the 80th chapter. It can be found on page 549 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bible. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth with Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. O oh Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us scorn, you make us of the scorn of our neighbors, our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O oh God of hosts, let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself then we will never turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Andrea. And before I read today's special scripture passage for today's message, um, I do want to make a very special announcement, which is that we are having a free Christmas concert this afternoon here at 59 East Mound Street at 5.30 p.m. featuring our full St. John's worship band. So we're going to have our full band up here. You're also going to see members of St. John's Community Choir, and we are going to have our special guest, drag queen Anissa Love. Can I get a round of applause before we enter into today's message? I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that in a special place in the service because we are a church that does not shy away from making sure that we're here for people who need to be who they are and celebrating the diversity of human expression in our congregation and in our church and in our community. So today's special passage is from the first chapter of Matthew, 
verses 18 through 25. We've decided to do something just a little bit different today to lift up someone in the Bible who often gets overlooked. And Matthew described his story this way. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way, says Matthew. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, Mary was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly because at this point they were not married, so scripture can be a little confusing. But it's when they were engaged. They were not married yet, and Mary was found to be pregnant. But just when Joseph had resolved to dismiss her quietly, not marry her, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, said the prophet, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, good morning. Good morning, friends with us here. And friends at home, we are going full Advent today. We have our nativity set. We have three of our candles lit. And I continue to think about this idea of good news. We talked about it last week, too. This idea of good news. And we talked about, I think last week, we talked about maybe a wedding or the birth of a baby was good news. But I've been thinking more about it. And I've been thinking about, so how do we share this good news. So way, way back, way, way back, we started with what's called town criers. They would have a big bell, and they would stand outside and ring the bell, and they would announce maybe the birth of a baby or a wedding or some good news. So that was one way they shared good news. And then, oh, sometimes they would just take a sign and pound it into a door. And back then, the center of the community was the church. So sometimes the, the signs would go on the church door. That would be another way to tell good news. Ah, who remembers these? <laughs> Newspapers, a kind of a thing of the past, but a few people get them still, where they would print the good news and send it out to people in the newspaper. More contemporarily, thank goodness, we have computers and cell phones. Whether you want to see it or not, sometimes the news pops up. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good, but sometimes it's good, yes? And then we have this. We have this story today of an angel visiting Joseph. Now, as Pastor Jenny said, Joseph's plan was to send Mary away. She was pregnant. They weren't married. That wasn't done during Bible times. And that would have been kind of the end of the story, right? I mean, I, there she goes. Um, but an angel appeared to Joseph. And so in the Bible, angels are simply messengers from God. They have a message from God, and they came, and this angel came and gave it to Joseph. Now, I picture angels always be, almost always female in my mind, although not always female in the Bible, right? Some of them had male names, so we would assume. But wings, light, halos, beautiful faces, stuff like that, right? We don't know what angels look like. It's a nice idea. I think that's why we like to think of it this way. But this angel visits Joseph and tells him, I have good news for you. This son, this child that Mary is carrying is a child from God. Do not send her away. Now, I can only imagine 
what Joseph thought when he woke up from that dream, because that angel came in a dream. And um, I don't know, I usually don't remember my dreams, first of all, or if I do, I just kind of think about them for a little bit, and then they float out of my head, because they were dreams, they weren't real. But Joseph paid special attention to this angel and this dream, and he did indeed stay, indeed stay with Mary, named the baby Jesus, married her, helped to raise him. So he had an important role, and that is what we celebrate today. We're going to pray. We count to three. One, two, three. Then we clap our hands. Ready? One, two, three. Dear God, thank you for this story. That reminds us that you speak to us every day through people that we meet. Help us to listen and to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, who is coming down to Holy Moly? I have Miss Mary's favorite Christmas movie today. I know, everyone's going, I'm going to, come and hang. You coming to Holy Moly? Who's coming to Holy Moly? <laughs> it's awesome. seen 
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, many of us have children in our lives in some way or have had children in our lives in some way that have really focused this time of year on being on certain lists, the nice list or the naughty list. And a lot of Christmas movies right now are all about kids and, and trying to be on Santa's lists. Christmas is really a mere seven days away right now, and that's what kids are hearing about in our culture, about Santa and Christmas and presents and all of that. Many of our kids, whether they're our own kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, kids that we've helped shape. Kids are thinking about the Christmas list they sent to Santa Claus and they are making last ditch efforts. I will not ask you to raise your hands, but they are making last ditch efforts to make sure that whoever in their life needs to know what's on their list knows what's on their list. But this story made the news. It may sound familiar because it did make the news um, and it was very poignant. It was from a seven-year-old boy who asked for something different one Christmas. And his poignant note to Santa was broadcast on all of the news outlets. And he wrote, Dear Santa, we had to leave our house. Dad was mad. Mom said it was time to leave. And she would take us to a safer place where we did not have to be afraid. The little boy wrote, I am still nervous and I don't want to talk to the other kids. He said, are you going to come this Christmas, Santa? We don't have any of our stuff here. Can you bring some chapter books, a dictionary, a compass, and a watch? And I also want a very, very, very good dad. Can you do that too, Santa? Love, Blake, age seven. Blake's letter to Santa is heartbreaking and all too familiar. Too many children today don't have good father figures or good parental role models in their lives, much less good parental role models for blended, non-traditional, imperfect families like yours and like mine, especially kids who need adults to help them navigate a world that doesn't always understand who they are. How many of you have had good people in your life, good fathers, good men, good parental role models in your life, whether they were related to you or not, who helped you navigate a tough world? So many of you have told me about these kind of folks in your lives, and that's why today we wanted to give some attention to a figure in the Bible who often gets short shrift this time of year. Because during this season, we are talking about really maybe the most important, if not one of the most important, blended, non-traditional, imperfect families in the Bible. You may not think of the Holy Family in that way, right? But they were a non-traditional, imperfect, blended family. And they featured the step-parent, or I prefer the term bonus parent, features the bonus parent of Joseph. Have you ever thought of Joseph that way, as Jesus' bonus parent? Because Jesus, his quote-unquote father, was the son of God, according to the story. But one of the things I really thought about as I went back to this scripture, I was returning to the pulpit, and I thought of all the characters in the Christmas story, Joseph seems to me to be the most neglected this time of year. There was a pastor who put it this way, and I appreciated this. He said, just think about all the Christmas pageants you have seen in your life. How many of you have been to those Christmas pageants with kids? And yeah. So the pastor said, so think about every Christmas pageant with all the little kids dressed up in bathrobes. The shepherds and the angels make their impression early with their glorious and excited arrivals at the manger. 
The wise men always look splendid in whatever regal outfit has been prepared, carrying the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then in the pageant, all eyes are on Mary as she carries baby Jesus, real or, or doll, in her arms. And even the innkeeper in the pageant gets in on the action with his dramatic declaration that there's no room in the inn for the young couple to stay the night. But Joseph, in the pageant, Joseph usually just kind of stands there. You actually don't need a shred of acting experience to play the part. <laughs> You're just supposed to put on a bathrobe, be quiet, and follow Mary around, <laughs> right? But we Jesus followers actually owe a lot to Joseph, and we don't always know that. Now, some Christians will tell me that that's ridiculous, that God was Jesus' real father, Joseph was a mere bystander, unimportant. And conversely, if Joseph was Jesus' real father, then they will argue that Jesus isn't so important because he's no longer the son of God. Either way, they try and tell me, Joseph is far from a central figure. At most, he said, or they would argue, that we'll give him credit for protecting Jesus as an infant. That's the most they'll do. But it was the late great preacher and teacher, Fred Craddock, from the Candler School of Theology at Emory, who reminds us this time of year that we owe a lot to Joseph. Joseph raised Jesus as a boy, and it made a big difference in Jesus' life who his bonus parent was. Joseph was the man who taught Jesus and cared for him in his early years. He was the one who showed Jesus how to be a carpenter and took him to the synagogue to learn the scriptures and traditions of the faith. We followers of Jesus owe a lot to Joseph because without Joseph, we wouldn't have Christmas. Did you know that? Probably don't think of it that way, but without Joseph, we wouldn't have Christmas. Joseph, Jesus' bonus parent, was a necessary part of God's plan for raising this child, this Jesus, this young Emmanuel, who would become the Savior the world was waiting for. Now, I want to tell you a little more about Joseph because you may not know the story. How many of you know what marriages were like back in that time of day? How many of you have studied that? Yeah, the seminary students, keep your hands down. Our pastors. But most of you have no idea. You're like, what? I don't understand. Well, this was 2,000 years ago. And Joseph's manger side story was a complicated one because by all accounts, he shouldn't have been there. If Joseph had done what was expected of him, he would have traveled to Bethlehem alone in order to be registered, not dragging along his fiancée, Mary. The news of Mary's pregnancy left Joseph in a tough spot because in Joseph's time 2,000 years ago, engagement was much different than it is today. It wasn't just show the pretty ring on Instagram and the pre-choreographed big thing. Have you seen those engagements now? It's all like a big thing and it's all on Instagram and it's, it's great, it's nice. I'm not, I'm not knocking fancy engagements, I'm not. But I am saying that back then, it was very, very different. And historically, this story about Joseph Quandry has caused innumerable woes for Christians. Because at its core, in this story, Joseph first assumes that Jesus is that terrible word. I am going to say it, but I hate the word. But he's going to assume that Jesus is what we used to call a bastard, a child born out of wedlock, fathered by some unknown man. Isn't that the logical conclusion for Joseph 2,000 years ago? He finds his fiance pregnant by someone not him. And so Joseph, it says in the text, quietly makes this decision to end the engagement. Because at that time, being engaged at that time was kind of like being married at that time. It was a formal contract, it had been signed, and the parties could not end the engagement without a trial. You may not know that. If you go back in history, you can find this out. 
Parents often arranged for these marriages for their children far in advance, signing contracts when the children were little and only after the children were old enough and the husband could sufficiently provide for the wife did the man and woman move in together. Mary and Joseph could have been betrothed for years already in a legally binding contract. So now Joseph had choices to make. Faced with a pregnant wife at this time in history and in this tradition, faced with a pregnant wife who was not pregnant by him, or pregnant fiancé, I'm sorry, who was not pregnant by him, Joseph had two choices. He could, number one, call for a public trial. Number two, he could have asked everyone for advice, talking with the family and the neighbors, wondering what the church thought about the situation, what God's will was. But, of course, in a small village like Nazareth, this would not remain quiet for long. It would be kind of like asking the question about Mary's virtue on Facebook. The disastrous news would be all over town. We all know far too well today the damage that social media opinions can cause, which was essentially Joseph's second choice. Number one, call for a public trial. Number two, ask everybody for advice, including probably the local rabbi, to find out what to do. But either of these options would have been public and they would have humiliated Mary at that time in that society. Now, Fred Craddock, in his teaching about this, said Joseph did have a third option that I want to bring to your attention. He could just cite the Bible, the scriptures at that time, the Hebrew Bible, and he could say, let's just do what the Bible says, what the Torah says. You could say it's right there in the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 23 through 24. Anybody know where I'm headed with this? I only have one. Yeah, pastors, okay. Yeah, Hank is like, yep, I do. But most of you are not spending your time reading Deuteronomy. Anybody read Deuteronomy this week? All right, that's what I thought. All right, so I'm going to tell you. It says in the scriptures at that time, that if a woman, a virgin, is engaged to be married and is found to be pregnant by another man, that woman is to be stoned to death. That's what the scriptures said at the time. We don't talk about that in the manger story, do we? We kind of gloss over that in all our nostalgia about the season. And you all know that I'm, I'm as much for nostalgia as the, rest, as the next person, but I don't want it to get in the way of us understanding the heart of this story and what it means to be a Joseph in a child's life. So the scriptures say that in this circumstance, the woman is to be stoned to death. That's what Joseph's Bible says. So I was very moved by Dr. Craddock's preaching and teaching about Joseph's dilemma. He said it this way, and I really appreciate how he expressed this. He said, I get sick and tired of people always thumping the Bible as though they can open it up and turn it to one passage that clears up everything about complex issues. He said, you can quote the Bible before killing a person to justify the killing by saying, well, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, the Bible says. We all know that. We've heard that one. And we all know, despite what it says literally in the Bible, that two wrongs don't make a right. How many of you taught your children in your lives, kids that you know, how many of you taught your kids that two wrongs don't make a right? Okay. Wise people know that if we followed the biblical retributive um, justice model, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, of course, everyone would be blind and toothless because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, right? We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Well, when Dr. Craddock preached on this passage, he would keep going with all of the biblical proof texting that we've all grown tired of hearing, and then he would say, because he would really weave a story for hours, and he ended all of that proof texting by saying, I've run into so many people who carry around a 43-pound Bible and say, just do what the good book says. And yet we know that the good book of ancient laws could not cover every single conceivable circumstance in life. We know that. 
And we know that today we still have to figure out what's right, what's ethical, what's loving to do in the most complicated of situations. Because think about it. Even today, as parents, grandparents, parental figures, when do we prod our children to do their best and when do we unconditionally support them no matter what the Ohio legislature in their misguided nonsense says? Some of you know what I'm talking about. As employers, when do we give a second chance? When do we show compassion? As members of this church, when do we stand firm on an issue? When do we defer to other people's views? As followers of Jesus, how do we know what the right thing to do is when there isn't a specific predetermined answer in the scriptures to our modern day dilemma? For example, how do we support families with kids who are considering even gender affirming care in a state where the legislature is saying that they're not gonna allow that they're not going to allow kids to become who God has called them to be, who God has made them to be. And those legislatures are citing the Bible and the scriptures to justify their actions. That particular issue is not done, so I encourage you not to lose hope. It's not done, it's not over because our Bible teaches us how to look at things in new ways. And Joseph teaches us that. So, back in this ancient narrative, Joseph had laws to follow laid out in the Ten Commandments. He also had stories passed down through the ages in his religious tradition of how God acted with and for the people. And Joseph knew that the letter of the biblical law had harsh consequences for young, pregnant, out-of-wedlock Mary, as we used to say. The choices were a humiliating trial, humiliating her in public, or a deadly stoning. But the story says today in the Gospels, the Gospels say that Joseph was a good man a righteous man, a man in right relationship with God. He read his scriptures through a certain lens, the lens of the character and nature of a God who is loving and kind. Therefore, Joseph says, and I am, yes, I'm putting words in his mouth because we don't hear him in this text. I should say in the text that follows. But you can imagine yourself in Joseph's shoes. He's made this decision. He's, he's made things that are reported in the scriptures. And he's essentially saying, I will not harm Mary or abuse her, expose her, shame her, ridicule her, demean her value, her dignity, her worth. I will instead protect her. And Dr. Craddock taught that Joseph was the first person in the New Testament who learned how to read the Bible through the spectacles of the grace and the goodness and the love of God, not through abusive biblical literalism. How many of you have thought of Joseph in that way? Not just as a bump on a log in a bathrobe following Mary around. I'm serious, right? Joseph was the first person in the New Testament who learned how to read the Bible correctly through the spectacles of the grace and the goodness and the love of God, not through abusive biblical literalism. In Dr. Craddock's words, if in reading the Bible you find justification for abusing, humiliating, disgracing, harming, or hurting, especially when doing so makes you feel better about yourself, you are absolutely wrong. The Bible is to be read in the light of the character of God. So as Joseph wrestled with the right thing to do, he was not simply just looking at the surface words of the Bible. He read deeply into it to understand God as completely as he could so he could better discern God's will. Once Joseph made his decision to protect Mary based on a faithful and grace-filled reading of the Bible, God did the rest. 
which in some ways means it's really already Christmas. It's Christmas really already because of Joseph, a man willing to risk his standing in society to do the right thing. So Joseph stayed with Mary and committed to raising a baby with her. He resisted a popular and easy interpretation of the Bible, deciding instead to read his Bible through the spectacles of God's grace. Joseph stood by the manger that Christmas night, maybe a little shell-shocked, maybe a little overwhelmed, but committed, and very much a husband and a father to a young woman and infant child who were huddled close. Now, we don't hear a lot more about Joseph after this passage in the first chapter of Matthew. He fades into the background in the scriptures almost as quickly as he came into view. The rest of the narratives are appropriately about Jesus, but did you ever think about that? How quickly Joseph just kind of fades into the background after the manger story? But as a parent, I have to think about the time in between that manger scene and when we again meet Jesus as a 12-year-old and then an adult. Did you ever notice how much of Jesus' teenage years are missing? That's a topic for another day. But think about that time in between when we see Joseph at the manger scene and when we see Jesus at older ages. Because I have to think that in that in-between time, Joseph taught Jesus a thing or two about how to read his Bible, about how to read the scriptures, about how to interpret them. Jesus was a Bible teacher after all. He ended up being called rabbi. And for much of his ministry, Jesus interpreted, even reinterpreted the world through a different kind of lens, reading the scripture through the spectacles of God's grace. So I have to think that when Jesus was teaching his followers that it was, for example, okay to heal on the Sabbath when that was forbidden, that it was okay to sit at table with those who've been marginalized or made mistakes even though that was forbidden at the time, that it was okay to uh, be with people who were considered different at the time, that was prohibited, but Jesus said it was okay, that it was okay to say that those without sin should cast the first stone. I could go on, but I have to think that when Jesus was using the scriptures to teach these things in a new way, he was, at least in part, shaped by his earthly father who learned to read the Bible that way years before. Think about that. I, for one, am grateful that Joseph is around in this narrative to help us get ready. A man who showed the power of filtering God's word through the prism of God's love. We desperately need more Josephs, however you identify gender-wise. We need more Josephs, more parental figures who identify as Josephs. We need more Josephs in our world today. Like the very, very, very good dad that seven-year-old Blake asked for from Santa. Whether you are a man or a woman, queer, trans, non-binary, whatever, know that you are needed in this world because now more than ever, we need people who are willing to do the right thing for our children. We need people willing to stand up to biblical literalists who abuse the scriptures for their own advantage. We need people willing to argue that the letter of the law should be defied in some circumstances when it means, for example, deporting children away from their parents at very young ages or denying kids the gender-affirming care that they don't just need but they deserve. We need people willing to see the faintest of light in a dark world, who can then share that hope and more importantly, the joy with the rest of us. Now more than ever, we need Josephs in our world who can help us remember that the most powerful earthly action 
our human superpower is to love a child into the fullness of their being time and time again because it's already Christmas. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Mighty parent God, help us to welcome your son Jesus this season with joy in the days ahead, even when it is cloudy and raining. As we look at the world, knowing today that we can look at the world with new eyes and open hearts, unafraid to break any rule but the rule, God, to love you and all that you have made. Guide us, God, in our loving rule-breaking as we manifest your kingdom here on earth this holy season. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we come to this time of offering, I again want to give thanks for our amazing team, Hank, Mary, Skip, all of you, everyone who made sure that the last few weeks have gone off without a hitch. There is much to give praise for, but our church depends upon all of you and those of you watching online and those of you wondering if you should make a Christmas gift to a church or to some institution by the end of the year. And I'm here to tell you that your gifts matter. They help us do tremendous ministry in our community. So today, as we offer our gifts to God. Let us give praise and thanks to God for the miracles and the blessings in our lives. And let us offer our gifts to God of our treasure, time, and talents, especially during the season of joy.
Please stand as you are able for the traditional doxology. Let us pray now together as Jesus taught us to pray 2,000 years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
All right, everybody, this is the celebration song. So get up, shake your keys around. You got some percussion. We're going to play along with us. our worship team today. Um, thank you to all of you for being here and all that you've done in these past few weeks. Please remember to come back, get here a little early so you can get here a good seat. Come back for our 5.30 p.m. free concert. It is not too late to invite your family and friends. There are no tickets, no anything. It's free to the community with our special guest, Anissa Love, as well as St. John's full worship band and members of the community choir. So please join us. And as you leave from here today, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace while you go forth to joyfully live the gospel like it's already Christmas. Thanks be to God. Amen.